great pleasure to introduce Yair Rosenthal, professor and uh, graduate program director of the graduate program in oceanography, but also a member of Earth and Planetary Sciences. So he's truly spanning the divisions of EOAS and uh, uh, schools at Rutgers. Um, Yair is going to talk about, take us to the Western Tropical Pacific from several field expeditions that he ran there, most notably Expedition 363 in the Pacific Warm Pool uh, by the International Ocean Discovery Program. And I was on the panels when that proposal was submitted and it came through like a very, very well greased, very well done proposal. Greg Mountain was involved with collecting the seismics and uh, it, it, just the proposal was wonderful. Um, but background of the story is, you know, we are an international group. We try to do international work almost from pole to pole in the tropics. Um, one of the more challenging places to work in terms of geopolitical aspects is Indonesia. In fact, it's one more difficult than trying to work offshore China, offshore India, about equivalent to trying to work offshore Brazil. It's extremely difficult. And Yair should be given great kudos uh, for being able to operate in Indonesian waters. Now, the drill ship itself has never been able to drill there uh, in the modern era, nor will it likely consider an Indonesian government. But Yair continues to get in and collect uh, gravity and piston cores and other data in, within Indonesian waters. And so without further ado, we're off to Indonesia and the warm pool. Although you're mostly drilling in Papua New Guinea waters, right? No, no, but, no, uh, you'll get a lot of Indonesia. Uh, do I have the... Just pull down under share? Uh, okay. uh, content and I suggest sharing just your... Uh, oh, no, wait a minute, I made a mistake. Hold on a second, share content, and PowerPoint. All right, everyone can see that? Yes. Uh, so, all right, couple things. Well, thanks for the invitation. I totally forgot, I have to admit, so Ken asked me uh, a couple days ago, and uh, I decided that, uh, not to speak just about 363. I mean, I was inspired by Jim, who gave the talk about preparing uh, um, IODP um, expedition. So I wanted to tell you what went into my uh, expedition. And in fact, I, I would say all my career uh, uh, in working the Indo-Pacific warm pool. All right, so this is uh, basically a travel through time, a uh, 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 past of nostalgia. And uh, I did it because a lot of people deserve the credit. So what we see here is essentially uh, uh, one of the outcomes, uh, 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 which is Expedition 363. We see here uh, uh, um, the, um, the Derek of, of the JR, so a piece of the JR. And one of the things that I want to show you here is essentially where my, my cursor is, that's Papua New Guinea. And above that, you nicely see the clouds. So I'll, I'll get to the clouds that essentially are uh, one of the characteristics or uh, the importance of the Western Pacific Pole in terms of precipitation, humidity, so on and so forth. So it is, uh, Ken asked me to talk about Expedition 363, but I want to tell you that before that, I have four cruises essentially that uh, uh, helped in, in developing the idea and, and essentially moving on to the proposal. So the, the famous one and the most important to my career was the Corit. We'll get it in Indonesia 2003. Then uh, we have two core cruises with a uh, German ship, the Sone, the Vital in, in 2005, and then 2013, and then uh, the 2013, uh, sorry, 2013, yeah, another Indonesian, and then uh, another uh, uh, cruise on the Roger Ravel. We'll talk about all of them. All those essentially uh, prepared, uh, the background and gave us the opportunity essentially to go to uh, a core at, at, uh, at IODP 363. In fact, 
you'll see that uh, the, the Earth Expedition was born out from some of the results and, and, and desire to uh, uh, test some of the hypotheses that developed in the other cruises. Uh, so why the Indo-Pacific warm pool? Um, why am I interested? Uh, two, a few reasons they are, but let's start with the science. So what I'm showing you is a map of sea surface temperature. And as you would uh, expect, the warmest temperature are in the equator, but the real warmest in, on, on the surface of the ocean are, as we see it here, it's the isotherm 28 degrees that you see over here that essentially uh, contain both parts of the Indian Ocean and the Western Pacific warm pool that is on the Pacific side. Hence, we call it the Indo-Pacific uh, warm pool. This is essentially because it's so hot, it's the global heat engine and also the major source of moisture to the atmosphere. So uh, it really is uh, the, the, the engine of climate, so to speak, and we'll go to it. Because of the heat or, or the warm surface uh, temperature, let me just uh, uh, get rid of some. Okay, I think I'm okay. Of the heat, essentially, we have deep atmospheric convection that you have only at temperature, sea surface temperature above uh, 26 degrees. So what you see over here, again, that's Papua New Guinea, so it's Western Pacific warm pool. During the expedition, you see the major clouds coming all the way up from for the surface to the, the up to the atmosphere, real deep convection. In other words, rising uh, moisture due to the heat. And you can see the rain coming uh, uh, with the black uh, uh, part or the dark part over here. So this is almost daily in this area during the, day, the uh, um, rainy season. And you get something on the order of, you know, the highest precipitation rates that we have on the planet anywhere between, uh, you know, four and five meters per, uh, per year. So really a lot, um, a lot of precipitation. So if we look uh, uh, at the global, you know, atmospheric convection or, or, or cycle, those of you that are not uh, oceanographer or atmospheric scientists, you know, we have uh, the prevailing uh, warm, uh, sorry, wind system. And some of the most important thing that we have is uh, the meridional Hadley cell that is due to the rising uh, uh, moisture that we have, heat and moisture in the tropics. And remember, moisture is really important because it carries most of the heat in the form of latent heat. Visible heat is, is really uh, negligible in this case. So it's rising uh, uh, along the equator or, or a little north of the equator and then going toward the mid latitude. On the way, it drops all the rain. So the subsiding uh, uh, um, air is essentially dry and the cause of the subtropical uh, deserts that we have. Another very uh, important uh, uh, wind system that is of concern in the equatorial Pacific is the equatorial, sorry, the Walker circulation that essentially is due to the pressure gradient between the east and the west due to the uh, sea level pressure and sea surface temperature gradient. So those, those systems are really important and any change or perturbation on this, in these systems can cause uh, uh, not just regional uh, uh, climate and, and, and uh, um, uh, changes, but also very important global changes. Of course, the famous of those is the El Nino system. So just to show you again, the present day surface uh, uh, salinity, uh, <coughs> salinity uh, sorry, let's start with the left, the, the present day rainfall that we see over here, this is on the long wave outgoing uh, radiation. And you can see nicely that there is a belt. So in 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 the boundary is the West, the Indo-Pacific uh, Western Pool, and there is in this this belt there is a belt of high precipitation here in millimeter per day. So something on the order of eight ten millimeter per day. So the first um, northernmost belt is the uh, ITCZ, the Intertropical Convergence Zone. We'll talk about that later, but essentially it's the rain belt that seasonally follow the sun and going south uh, during the winter and it's in the north during the summer. And the offshoot that is going toward uh, uh, south or southeast is the South Pacific Convergence Zone that is affecting essentially Papua New Guinea. You can see that there is uh, expression 
of the precipitation on, on the sea surface salinity. So even though we have very high evaporation rate in the equator due to the temperature, really the precipitation is what drive relatively low salinity. So we are looking at, at the system that is driven by a, a control dominated by the precipitation. And as I mentioned, perturbation on, on interannual, um, well, let's say, I should say before, on a seasonal uh, 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 time scale, essentially this precipitation is controlled by the monsoon system. I'll talk about that later. And that's a very uh, uh, predictable system these days. But on interannual scale, we have perturbation of the uh, ENSO, which is the Nino Southern Oscillation uh, 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 System. And here I'm showing you the two uh, uh, perturbation from the normal uh, situ uh, situation. So if we go back and now look at the map that we have in the bottom over here, those are the sea surface temperature uh, uh, during those events. So in a normal uh, situation, we have a zonal gradient whereby the uh, Western Pacific warm pool, the Western side is warmer, is about 30 degrees centigrade, whereas in the North, where we get upwelling, along the Eastern Equatorial Pacific, we get about uh, four, five, six degrees cooler, and that's called the cold tongue. So the pressure gradient essentially caused the water circulation to go this way, pushing the warm uh, uh, water all, all the way to the uh, uh, Western side. And essentially you have the compression over this area, get a lot of precipitation. During uh, uh, El Nino, you have slackening or weakening of, of the wind system, so the water circulation is weakened, and essentially the warm pool is starting, the warm water is starting to move eastward, and, 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 and the precipitation or the convection is slave to the sea surface temperature, so also the uh, uh, convection and, and precipitation is moving eastward. That's when we get both in the Central Pacific and in the uh, um, South America, Peru, and all this area, we get a lot of precipitation. So this is known as El Nino, which is the baby uh, uh, um, of Christ, uh, uh, and it happened only in, uh, and happened in, in December. Whereas, you know, the offshoot or the, the, the rebound is known as La Nina, the girl, where, you know, the Western Pacific warm pool, the warm pool water going even further to the west and we get more precipitation. So this is an interannual uh, phenomenon, but it always locked to the seasonal cycle. It's always during December, the warming of the water essentially uh, um, inhibit the upwelling and, and El Nino had been known by uh, fishermen in Peru long before scientists uh, uh, even thought about that because the fisheries, which is mainly anchovies, would die at that time. And it always was in, in, in December, so uh, they called it El Nino, the baby for Christ. So, so uh, just um, one sec, one second, yeah, I just ahead. want to make a little comment here because it's, that's, the second most productive region of upwelling in the world after the Benguela. And you're right, of course, the anchovy, but the, the funny thing is that those anchovetas were harvested in the last 50 years for chicken food. So um, the price of chickens was very carefully calibrated to whether we would have an El Nino or La Nina year. And uh, if they, we were starting to have an El Nino year, the price of chickens, even before the anchoveta were not harvested, would go up by a factor of about 30%. Just a, a minor comment here. So you can make a lot of money following the El Nino, La Nina years if you are investing in chickens. Actually, uh, thanks, Paul. And everyone, feel free to interrupt. But actually, you know, the, the social and economic uh, implication of ENSO are in, enormous. It's not just chicken. It's it's anywhere from, uh, uh, you know, the gasoline cost for, for airline and and, uh, and agriculture. Cynthia Rosenzweig at Gis uh, is famous for predicting it. And believe it or not, the price of, of ice cream, uh, one of our fellow Paleoceanographer worked for Nestle, Will Howard, to try to predict El Nino. So yeah, it has huge implication. It's the biggest atmospheric perturbation in our climate system, and and therefore it's uh, highly uh, studied. 
Anyway, let me take you through my own, you know, finishing my PhD, as you all, this is even a Corona uh, uh, virus, you know, I was left with the question, so what's next for research? That was not an easy question because, uh, you know, you finish and you think everyone is doing everything, so what's left for me? So one thought was, uh, uh, you know, going core, but then I looked at an older map even of, of uh, Flamont Doherty, the core per day, and you can see that there is not much space to core there. So I said, well, maybe we should go to the moon, but then I realized I heard that the ocean is frozen there. That left me with a very little thing. So at that time I met, uh, well, I knew, but both uh, Brad Lindsley and Delia Oppo, we started to inter get interested in, in the Pacific Ocean and the Western Pacific warm pool. But again, where should we core? And, and I had this brilliant idea, let's work in Indonesia, until I looked at the map and I got this uh, sign, essentially, pirates in there. And then called the State Department and basically say, well, forget about it. There are pirates, there is terrorism at that time. SARS was at that time. And of course, the Indonesian wouldn't let us work in those uh, um, water. So, that was pretty depressing start of my uh, uh, post PhD work, but then I met Fadli so uh, Simsodian, Indonesian uh, student, actually a student of Dale Heidewogel at DMCS or IMCS at that time, and with him we designed the first uh, uh, cruise with the question of, you know, what climate changes, you know, happened during the Holocene and what can we learn the future and in Indonesia because of this interannual variability and the cadal variability really you don't know should you expect uh, flooding that's uh, you know Paul call, uh, talked about the chicken but there is huge human suffering and cost there you can get during La Nina huge uh, 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 flooding that you see here with damage to every every uh, uh, property that you have or during severe El Ninos, essentially you get uh, uh, fires, big uh, uh, forest fires that have implication, of course, to uh, wildlife. This is uh, trying to rescue Indonesian orangutan from Borneo will get there and, and, and uh, atmospheric conditions that essentially uh, affect the health of people all over Southeast Asia. That's a big program there. So, Trying to talk and talk with people, with Delia, with, with, with Brad, Arnold Gordon, we started to realize that one of the major player in, in climate there is also what's known as the Indonesian through flow, the ITF over here, which is the return warm flow of the uh, thermohaline circulation. This is the only equatorial flow, so therefore it's relatively warm transferring both uh, buoyancy or salinity, if you want, from the Pacific and also uh, heat, both through the water and also by uh, air-sea exchange. And, and that goes, as you notice, so those of you that don't know, let me introduce you to this area. So over here, we have uh, Vietnam and, and Korea. Then uh, we have Thailand, essentially Singapore. This is Sumatra, Java, and the rest of the island. The big uh, uh, island that we see is Borneo, or Kalimantan, as the Indonesian are calling it, and then over here, Sulawesi, and that's Papua New Guinea. So the ITF chose to go through the Indonesian seaways for reasons that we don't, uh, we won't discuss over here. And then most of this is going exiting to the Indian Ocean through the uh, uh, Timor Channel and constituting the South Equatorial Current and then going all the way to the Agulas Current and, and then northward into the North Atlantic. So that was the, the, the purpose of our uh, record. And we designed this, this uh, uh, um, expedition called Collaborator. We called it CORIT. You can see it here. It was a collaborating oceanographic research expedition of the Indonesian through flow. The one thing that I didn't realize when I worked on that is that um, Indonesia won't let any, any research vessel, American research vessel there. So we had to, those are different times and NSF gave us enough funding to actually rent the Indonesian vessel. You see here the Baruna Jaya, which was not a coring a polyethnographic vessel. And I'll show you, we had to uh, essentially, we got money to convert it into a coring. Uh, uh, vessel and we 
basically designed a cruise starting in, in Jakarta over here and following the Indonesian through flow pass and pouring through this area. So we get better idea both on the climate change and the changes in circulation in the Indonesian through flow. A lot of my uh, uh, design was based on brochure that, that the Indonesian had. And I was very happy until I realized that there is nothing between the brochure and, and uh, what we have. So this is just to show you, introduce you. There are a lot of people on this bus. It was a joint program with Indonesia and, 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 uh, and the Radges to this extent. There are some uh, people that some of you know, Kerry Lear, who was my first postdoc. This is Fadli over here, the Indonesian I have, Thibode Garidel, now at Sirej, uh, Belia Oppo, of course, myself, Brad Lindsley, uh, um, Rindy Osterman, and, and, and uh, those of you that know, Christy Dahl was uh, also working with, at Rutgers with uh, Tony Broccoli. So uh, this is where we started with a lot of students, which is uh, one thing that I always do. So we got there uh, and after a lot of hassle, we realized we have to build the coring platform. So those of you that were on ocean vessel and you'll see also the JR will appreciate that this uh, platform was essentially plywood. And I made them essentially uh, weld all night. So we got the, the coring, uh, um, platform and then we had to assemble the the, the coring uh, bucket and all the coring uh, equipment where we built ahead of time so uh, Jim Broda went to the shipyard and we learned how to you know we designed that and we installed it everything at night and then you know everything was set to go you can see now the bucket and and everyone is setting the, the, the uh, gravity core that's all we could do at that time and over here, you see, we are standing on this uh, uh, um, uh, plywood, essentially, coring platform, and always hoping that the core won't fall on that, and uh, basically, we all go to the water. So everything was uh, good to go. I was very happy. And then in the morning, as uh, we start to go, I realized that we don't have seismic. So here is Brad Lindsley sitting near basically a sophisticated fish finder. That's all we had a fish fighter to go and 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 that's the kind of thing that we got uh, so those of you that look at seismic and appreciate you know and we had to uh, try to figure out whether yellow is good or red is bad and things like that so not much to uh, 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 start with and then we realized that again all the coring uh, um, equipment that we are used to on the winches is is non-existent so we calibrated, here is Delia Oppo calibrating the speed essentially of, of the winch, for example, for the coring. So we have a different uh, piece of wood, one for 100 meter per, per second, per minute, sorry, another for 60. We really had to improvise there and realize, and then I went to my, uh, use my skills as a tour guide and, and got my uh, Lonely Planet uh, uh, book got the map and we decided you know we are going down and found it i mean the option was not to go or to go and uh, if we didn't go we will never get um funded again so for 35 days we cored essentially without knowing what we actually are coring the quality of of those uh, cores but we had to relax, so that's something, you know, Jim show all the hotels, so I got jealous, and I'll just show you some of that. I mean, this was the Indonesian cruise, so uh, we got to essentially uh, spend the time, again, Carrie Lear, those of you that remember Carrie and Suzanne was here, James Sands was a student of what's all uh, at that time, and in the bar, essentially in Bali, this is uh, Carrie and Suzanne. And this is a midway in the Banda Sea. Essentially, I stopped the the, the, the vessel and and got everyone to take uh, uh, diving, snorkeling, essentially in one of the volcanic uh, atolls that we have there. So that was fun. So despite everything, of course, anxiety was high. This this is one of the. I mean, this was for me, and I've been on many cruises, the hardest ever, but most challenging and one of the most rewarding that I had, not just scientifically. I mean, scientifically, we got like four science paper, one nature, several na nature geoscience, but, but you know, overcoming all this, this uh, uh, um, 
issue is one of the things that we, as, as those of us that want to work in the field, have to learn. You know, this is oceanography. You have to improvise. So just some highlight, Delia Opo, uh, we published a paper looking at the common era that you see over here and showing that the Western Pacific warm pool essentially temperature. So this is the anomaly from the uh, 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 modern, not modern, but uh, uh, the temperature um, during the 60s, 80s, that you see, and it just co-vary with the Northern Hemisphere hockey stick that, that uh, that Michael Mann published before. So we show that the, uh, uh, the temperature in the uh, uh, warm pool is essentially following the global temperatures that we have. We also showed nicely, and that's the work of Justiran and us, is that during the warm period, essentially the mid -warm, uh, medieval warm period that we have here, the rain belt, the so-called intertropical conversion zone, was located further to the south, following the sun as we know today, from the uh, um, annual or seasonal variability. Whereas the cold little ice age, the, uh, the essentially the uh, intertropical conversion zone or, or the, the tropical belt, essentially we argue moved south. I mean, there are. Still debate whether that was a, a, a shift to the south or expansion and shrinkage. We need more uh, um, dates to do that. Uh, to look at that. This other thing that uh, uh, was a big theme of our study is to look at the Holocene changes. And I'm just showing you here that during the, the past almost two decades, essentially now, there was a lot of interest in what we call the Holocene thermal maximum. This is uh, the record of Gerald Hogg, Larry Peterson from the Cariaco uh, Basin over here, over in Venezuela, over that you see, and the, the, the ITCZ in the east is behaving very differently than the west. It's very narrow and it splits seasonally. And what you see here is the titanium record, the XRF uh, 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 record of a core in uh, IODP core in the Cariaco Basin that is interpreted as reflecting precipitation. And it's nicely showing you that after we go from the younger dryas, it gets to more precipitation during the Holocene thermal maximum, and then you have less and less progressively less uh, precipitation throughout the Holocene. It has a lot of millennium scale variability. And if you look at one of the uh, uh, um, one of the famous uh, uh, speleothon uh, cave or cave deposit records from uh, uh, from uh, South East China. Again, we see here the uh, oxygen isotopic composition of the um, of the speleothon uh, or the calcite deposited in the cave cave deposits, which is interpreted to uh, reflect some seasonality. So here is a reflect, uh, 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 was interpreted. It's, it's still controversial, but it's probably the right interpretation that during the warm time, the warm uh, 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 Holocene thermal maximum, we have stronger summer uh, 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 monsoon, what's called the strong uh, summer East Asian monsoon. And then as you know, following the sun, essentially the insulation, which is a summer insulation, I don't have it here. Uh, essentially, there is a weakening of the summer monsoon and less precipitation in this area. So we wanted to also see what's going on in in in, uh, in our core in the Western Pacific Warm Pool. And one of the first compilation was Laurel Stott, but real uh, uh, other compilation based on uh, the the the, uh, the core eight expedition. Uh, uh, Brad Lindsley did uh, one of the first uh, expedition looking at the evolution of Indonesian through flow and the Western Pacific warm pool. And what he sees there, and remember the argument uh, for the uh, uh, common era, and, and that, that really the Western Pacific warm pool is kind of the thermometer of the planet. It is the warmest uh, temperature and should reflect to a large extent the uh, global temperature. So again, going through the deglaciation, we get to some sort of a maximum during the Holocene climate optimum. And then essentially we're getting, uh, um, um, we're getting uh, uh, cooling. This is not much. I wanna make sure that you understand we're talking here about something about less than one degree. Interestingly enough, 
we looked also compare it for, with the uh, sea level record that you see over here because it has something to do with the plumbing in the seaway there. And you can see that at least the, the uh, sea level record is not mimicking or following that, that temperature record. The other thing that just tyranny did uh, at that time also look at what happened during that time uh, uh, to the precipitation. Here's model result, uh, what she did with Allegra and us. And, and the bottom line, uh, what you see here essentially is the difference between 6K, which is considered by many modeler as, as the mid Holocene because we, you know, most of the ice sheets were retreated or withdrawn at that time and the modern. So the difference will tell you, for example, when it's uh, dark blue, it's more precipitation, where it's uh, uh, brown, it's drier relative to the modern. And the bottom line here, you can see it, it's two things, is that it's seasonally variable and specially variable. So it's not just simple uh, uh, movement of the ITCZ. If we believe the model that based partly on the data that we got from the Macassar, from, from our work, you know, there is a lot of fraternogeneity in the system, and therefore we need more core. So Paula was also a postdoc in the lab. She left in 2016, and she compiled a lot of sea surface temperature record, uh, uh, trying to understand, you know, this this is this variability. First, why we get the cooling in in the sea surface temperature, which was not really obvious, and secondly. What's the spatial and, and temporal variability? So just to show you different core from the north to the south, this is the Papua New Guinea that we have here. Some of them are flat, some of them are cooling, others are maybe slightly warming, some very small. So there is a special variability that depends on the location and the latitude of this course. And you can see if you regress the Holocene, you get very small uh, slopes, but nonetheless uh, variable. And another uh, paper that got a lot of attention was a 2013 paper where we use a, a, a newly uh, a new proxy, and this species called Hyalina baltica that seemed to be really recording very well temperature. And here we tested what how the uh, intermediate water temperature responded to those changes. This was just when uh, Sean Marcot will go to him uh, at the end published his uh, compilation synthesis uh, stack for the Holocene with Peter Clark, arguing that uh, the uh, Holocene thermal maximum was, was significantly uh, warmer than the rest of the Holocene. It just cooled uh, after 6,000 years, what's known as the neoglaciation in the Northern Hemisphere. And they were argue that while we see a, a, a major warming in the surface, essentially it did not exceed the global mean temperature, more than one, did not exceed the, uh, um, the, uh, the temperature at the Holocene thermal maximum. So just to show you, here is the record that I did with the Benthic Foraminifera and the bottom line that came from this, this record uh, for the purpose of this talk, that they all cooling from warm Holocene thermal maximum into a, a, a colder temperature. You see it at the 500 meter and then the 600 to 900 meter. And if you look then at the common era, at the top, I'm showing you the record that Delia Oppo, I just show you uh, a show of the surface uh, uh, temperature showing a nice uh, uh, consistent performance with the uh, what we know, the middle, uh, uh, middle warm, medieval warm period over here and the little ice age here. And in the uh, uh, intermediate water, it just followed it and then it cools and to a, a minimum and then barely uh, essentially not significantly warming, which should be expected because the intermediate water should not follow essentially the surface. There is more uh, uh, time there. And we compare the rate of changes of, of uh, air sea exchange. This is the time that uh, people were really interested in now with the ocean heat content. So we calculated the ocean heat content during each of this period. And then the rate of change and made the argument. <laughs> this was just 2013 when IPCC was about to come. So uh, uh, the argument that the rate that we recorded are much faster, uh, the rate, sorry, that we record today are much faster than what we see 
saw in the past. And that's obviously was a, a bomb fell uh, on the community. Both sides were taking, uh, um, you know, sides on that. And and uh, uh, and one of the argument that we had since then is that you know, if you want to understand it, you have to understand what's going on in the source region of the Antarctic intermediate water and sub uh, mod water. And, and that's essentially what uh, uh, Sam Bova with her JR100, that's the, uh, um, that's the objective and she has talked about that. So as I said, the response was, was uh, enormous. I mean, there were who knows how many you know, media and uh, things like that came, you know, New York Times did a, a for, you know, long interview, uh, Everyone uh, had this, and, and include the, the Congress. Um, so this this was good. This is a record of notes, but <laughs> I'll at the end go back. We haven't really, uh, uh, we still don't understand it. All this left me with the the feeling that okay, to really understand those changes, we need to go to period where you know we have more natural forcing and less anthropogenic forcing, which means we need to go deeper and older. And to add to this, uh, Zheng Yu Liu and a few of us published a, a paper where we say that the models, all the climate models that are used by, you know, for the IPCC, do not replicate essentially the Holocene terminal maximum as a mean annual feature. They can do it as a seasonal, but the mean annual always show cooler early Holocene and then warming. And uh, Zheng Yu uh, smartly <laughs> named it as the Holocene temperature conundrum, uh, arguing that we don't know how the proxy correct or the model. One of them is wrong, or both of them are wrong, so on and so forth. So, of course, that, that was where I realized we need more course and deeper course, and the way to do is, is design a, um, a JR expedition. But that's not, as Jim told you, that's not an easy thing to do. So here is the, the blueprint that we have with all the course and that we wanted to do, and we had to get some uh, uh, seismic data. We also realized that one of the priority in the Mindanao in the Mindanao region uh, is again pirate uh, uh, <laughs> region, so they won't let us go there, unfortunately. And then two other were too uh, uh, remote, and those are still uh, there for better time to call. So the next thing it was to get uh, uh, our master seismic person so you can see here greg mountain and design uh, uh, a site server in coring expedition so uh, greg and i wrote this proposal to sell in 2013 and in the tradition that i always do i had an open call for a student postdoc from different university including Rutgers. so uh, those of you that may uh, you know, recognize, of course, Greg is here. Oh, sorry. I'm here, Sam Bova over here, Kim Baldwin, those of you that know over here. And then uh, Kelly Gibson was uh, at the time and Clara Blattler and many others. A lot of them are still in the business. So we went there and we didn't listen to the warning about pirates. And when we got to the pirate region, that's what happened. We were captured, unfortunately, and uh, that was not a real nice way to deal with that. Here is uh, basically our uh, uh, leader now, Greg Mountain, screaming for help, but who can hear you? You are nowhere. So uh, I had to come and rescue them. And essentially, uh, so this was not uh, real, of course, you know, that was the, the uh, equator crossing. A lot of them were, were really asleep at that time. So after they went through the torture, we put them in a bath that I designed with the crew, essentially got some equator water and they all uh, were, were certified as, as equator crossers. So that was nice. Let me give you, uh, uh, Rob Hatfield uh, did a nice uh, 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 movie, as usual, uh, of some of the work that's going on in, on the ship. This is really quickly. And you can see here both some of the seismic and the preparation. We took a lot of multi-cores, that's still a Vargas, a lot of uh, gravity and piston cores. 
a lot of work. Those students thought that they came for training and they didn't realize, as I told them on day one, no training on my shift, they all work. So again, Kim Baldwin over here, uh, Gray Mountain, and everyone now is uh, deploying essentially the streamer, the air gun is already in, and we're going into the, uh, um, the site survey. So I'll give you some quick idea. Here we are pulling back the, the, the air gun, pulling down, and all this while sailing very slowly, and the streamers are something on the order of 800 meter tail that is following us. And in the lab, a lot of work in the lab on those, uh, unlike the, the Indonesian ship, we had good labs here. And the course all shipped to Rutgers. You can see here is Sam already. She was a student at, 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 uh, of Team Herbert at that time at uh, Brown. She joined us as many others over here recording. And uh, <coughs> all right, so, the, oh, sorry. And again, in the tradition of be me being a, 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 a tour guy, I, uh, I insisted that we all start, not all, some, some, most of us start in Papua New Guinea, because okay. I didn't want to be in Papua New Guinea and dive. So again, you can see Sam Bova over here, Clara, Kelly, myself in a nice uh, uh, um, hotel. And then we go diving, fantastic diving. Here we're coming into the... the and then Kelly and I are going to see the, the bird of paradise. So every cruise has its own uh, uh, um, trips that we have. The seismic coring was, uh, as I say, extremely useful. Great. Here is Greg Mountain over here with the streamer. And uh, just an example of two courses. that I'll talk to them off the uh, Sipic and Ramo on the Papua New Guinea northern side, the U1485, 1487, and other. Beautiful seismic. This is, you know, this is an area, and I forgot to say, uh, when we started designing, I started designing the, the, the expedition 363, I was in, in contact with the Indonesian for two years. And whatever we tried to talk to them, it was, it, it met with resistance. They didn't want to do, they had demand that we couldn't work. And at the end, we just say, the hell with that. We'll just move to Papua New Guinea. Uh, as you know, Papua New Guinea, the northern uh, uh, margin is very sharp because of tectonics. We'll get into this. So it's hard to find actually good coring. And it's amazing, as I'll show you, they found really beautiful record. Here's a, a, a Greg a rendition of what to expect from those seismics that we collected over here. But with this seismic, we went back essentially uh, uh, to the IODP and say, look, we have really good target and we should go and sail. So again, uh, uh, expedition now 363, uh, Christina Ravella, who was the correlator, and I decided that we have to check why we are doing it. So we went to Sumatra to see where I'm with time, monkeys and dive. And, and, and that was uh, fun. Uh, that's why I like going there. And here is now we're going to the proceeding of uh, to the, the expedition itself. This is the proceeding that's published already uh, two years ago. Over here, you see again the rain belt on the high convection, and some I'll show you some uh, example of the course. And in the map here, I'll show you uh, in, in yellow, you see the target that we have two course on the Northwest Australia within the Eastern Indian Ocean, and then seven more course essentially uh, uh, in the Pacific, some very high resolution near Papua New Guinea and other on the Euripic Ridge that we have there. The crew again, some uh, 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 people that you know. So uh, Anne Holborn and I were the co-chiefs. Again, Anne Holborn and I met on, on the Vital, uh, one of the cruises before in 2005. Uh, and Denise Kulahanek from uh, Texas a and was the uh, project manager or the science scientist that we call. And some names that uh, you know, here's Christina over here, Greg Mountain, Luke Buford. A lot of them are related to like uh, Sam Bova. Uh, of course, uh, Brad Lindsley, uh, Takuya, who was a year at Rutgers a year ago, Rob Hetfield, who is, I believe, listening to us, uh, and then Tali Babila, my student, and Jian Zhu that did, uh, uh, that did uh, sabbatical here. 
And we were young back then, and <laughs> this is the Radgas team. I found my uh, my locker uh, 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 towel, and and we represented essentially Radgas. So again, quickly, I'll show you what's going on here, uh, if I may. I don't have actually the time. What does it take to core? Okay, so to core uh, uh, on on the um, on the JR is very different than, than any other shape of what you saw. So if you're not familiar, this is kind of an introductory, how we do what we call, uh, start with APC coring, which is what we need. Uh, it's a piston coring on the JR to essentially get really fantastic core. So again, I don't know if you can hear it. Oh. Cores are cylindrical continuous hear rock it? samples taken from geological layers. A device called a hydraulic piston core is used to take cores from softer geological layers. First, the hydraulic piston core is run down to the coring point by the drill pipe. Then the core barrel is run down through the drill pipe by a wire from the vessel. Once the core barrel is in place, it is ready to take a core sample. The end of the core barrel is sharpened to a knife edge so it can pierce the geological layers. Seawater is pumped into the drill pipe from the vessel to apply high pressure to the core barrel. <clears throat> In just one second, a 10 meter long core is sampled. The barrel containing the core sample is pulled back up to the vessel by the wire. Then, the hydraulic piston core drills ahead down to the next coring point. This method is used until the piston core barrel can no longer penetrate the geological layers. Once harder geological strata are reached, the hydraulic piston core is pulled up. For hard geological strata, the coring system is switched over to the rotary core. So I'm going to skip the hard because we are interested in oceanographer that is, is mainly in the APC, um, the advanced piston coring. And here is one of those uh, uh, um, cores that we just got, nine meter cores. You can see the this is the, the text on the ship uh, uh, carrying it. So when a core comes, there is a, a yell on, on, on deck, a core, uh, core on deck, everyone runs. Once they pull it, they take this long sausage essentially and then they cut it into uh, one and a half uh, meter uh, section that we have here. And then, you know, we get on the course. So these are the section. We open them where the, the scientists, including uh, sometimes the co-chiefs that are usually sitting upstairs and writing reports. So once in a while they go to look. No, I'm kidding. Uh, they're going to get looking at the course themselves, essentially, and everyone and discuss it. And then the team leaders and, and other uh, 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 participant or crew members, not crew members, sorry, science mem members would present daily and weekly the results. So here's an example of uh, the presentation. Uh, at the top, we have uh, um, our major correlator, as you can see from her dress, uh, uh, Christina is presenting uh, hair, uh, um, you know, um, splices of, of the core. So we splice it in uh, uh, different cores, different holes. And then another Kumagai san is, is uh, talking about essentially the Paleo Mag record. So this is, of course, Halloween on, on board. We do have fun on board. Here's Brad Lindsley uh, celebrating his, his birthday, for example. And then our esteemed paleoceanographer and nano guy. So on the left is 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 uh, Rob Hatfield that is here and and uh, playing badminton on the heli deck. 
So we do try to have fun. So let's now get serious and look at the, at the, what we did. We did nine sites that we strategically located both in the Eastern Indian Ocean, 4082 and 4083, and then a few of them, four of them. So we have duplicate because again, it's a very challenging area in the Northern margin of Papua New Guinea. And then we have low side rates uh, uh, that, uh, uh, of course, on the or lower sedred course on the Euripic rise, uh, we got almost 7,000 meter essentially, of course. So that's quite a, a challenge. Oh, here is the attempt. So we almost broke the uh, record. So here is, you know, each side we're taking several holes and 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 uh, piston coring is usually to 350. Then we use what is called uh, partly drilling XCB extended coral barrel. And you can see essentially the depths from 500 meter and the ages. So we got the late Miocene in, in, in the Northwest uh, um, uh, margin of Australia. We got some Pliocene essentially in, in many of those regions. I'll talk about that. And then also Miocene in all, uh, all the way to the Oligocene on the Arabic Ridge. The set rates highly variable because of the highly variable uh, uh, environment that we have here. So again, you can see this, what we see is depths and, and age and the sharper the slope that you are, or the steeper the slope that you have over here, meaning that there is a uh, faster accumulation. So 1485, for example, we accumulate, here is the accumulation, right? Something on the order of, of uh, a meter per per um, per thousand years, whereas others we get few few centimeter per thousand years. So highly variable essentially sedimentation rate, which was good. We could uh, essentially um, um, address different question on different time scale. You see, the other thing is a really variable ethology. So we're going from uh, marl essentially with carbonate on the northwest for, um, on the sorry. Highly calcareous, uh, uh, meaning a lot of calcium carbonate uh, sediment on the open ocean and the Euripic rise over here. Three cores that we have. Northwest Australia, we have kind of a mixture of, of terrigenous with, with uh, uh, carbonate sediment that you have here. In all of them, you can see very nicely the layering that you have. And then Papua New Guinea, again, you can see uh, uh, very dark, it's, it's high sedimentation rate, low carbonate, and a lot of terrestrial material. I'll get there in a second. So carbonates, terrigenous, and uh, we got real great fossil there, and we have an amazing uh, team of uh, biostratigraphers. So when you go there, we rely on those biostratigraphers to tell us where we have. Uh, Luke Buford, one of the talk, uh, you know, was uh, Marie's uh, a student, was uh, one of the nano, and, and Paul Pearson was one of the, uh, um, uh, the Planktonic Forum, and they did a great job in providing us uh, a roadmap to where we are in the sediment. The preservation was also fantastic. We had a person that continuously documented the preservation. Especially in, in, in uh, those high sedimentation rates on the margins, the, the quick uh, bury with, with uh, uh, clay preserved the forms really fantastically. And we expect, you can see it over here, everything is like uh, in a new, almost, almost glossy forms. So several of the questions, and here I want to uh, 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 finish in the next uh, uh, 10, 15 minutes with, with the question. One question that we have, is what drives uh, variability in rainfall and convection in the Indonesian uh, uh, Indo-Pacific warm pool, okay? So again, I said uh, uh, the precipitation along this area is essentially uh, following the ITCC. So here's again the ITCC. The blue areas are rain belt, the intertropical convergence zone. That's conversion means that's where the moist and hot air is rising up essentially with the deep convection and, and you get a lot of precipitation and the, the, the uh, South Tropical, uh, uh, South Pacific convergence zone. And it follows the sun seasonally. So July, it's in the Northern uh, 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 position and, and had a lot of precipitation in, in China. Oh, 
and uh, in January, it moves all the way to the Southern Hemisphere. In fact, what you have is four monsoon system, the Indian in this area, the Indian uh, uh, monsoon, the East, the East Asian monsoon, South Asian monsoon, and the Australian monsoon. So each of them, you know, is perhaps part of the, you know, global system that we have here or just locally driven. And that's one of the questions that we uh, we're going to address uh, uh, whether, you know, precipitation in those regions is part of what has been known by, by Wang and Bin Wang as defined as the global monsoon, which he say that, you know, in, 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 in traditionally we look at the monsoon as, as driven by the temperature difference differential between land and sea. And here you say, well, it is actually a component of the uh, um, of a global monsoon system of which is part of the ITCZ, or those rainbow. And in this case, essentially, that would predict that there would be, the system will be antiphase or asymmetric. So when it's raining in the north, very dry everywhere in the south, and when it's raining in the south, very dry in the north. You can see it over here, the movement of the well and the net short wave radiation is going, following essentially uh, the solar heating. So that's one question that uh, IODP over the last uh, uh, 10 years was trying to address. And there were uh, several uh, uh, expedition going to the Bay of Bengal, to uh, um, Australia and other regions trying to uh, address this question. Here is, uh, uh, I want to start with looking at the Australian monsoon in this area. So this is again, the region that we call the two cores, 1482, 1483. The uh, changes in the, the trade winds and everywhere else is essentially providing the, 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 um, the forcing to the Australian monsoon over here. This is a seismic and the site of 1482 ironically was taken actually after the expedition, but uh, everything that I'll show you now came from N. They just took it a year later and uh, look how beautiful is, is, uh, uh, is essentially the layer that we have here. We did have some legal issues here between Indonesia and Australia about who uh, controls and uh, uh, that area and permission to, to drill, but we did it. So Anne just sent me uh, uh, this morning some data and I want to show you and Ken, that's for you. So this is 1482 sample at one point at every 10 centimeter. And uh, the, the isotope, the, this is what they call the preliminary uh, uh, benthic isotope record that you have over here. Uh, at the bottom, we have the oxygen, uh, uh, but the, it's all in Bulastorfer as you can see that, that you can find all species. And here is the oxygen isotopes that we see over here and the carbon-13 uh, measure in the same uh, uh, record. And, and I don't wanna go too much into this, but it's interesting that you do have here a lot of changes that have been seen elsewhere, mainly by N. Holberg, this myosin, and you get these this changes into Bentic uh, uh, Deloitte Maxima that could represent some, as she say, ephemeral uh, northern hemisphere glaciation. Uh, there is a big carbon safety shift known from the middle uh, uh, Miocene and, and other cores. But really fantastic in this course, we got really fantastic precessional cycles in the XRF data. So here you see one precessional cycle over the section that is core. And in this case, I believe it's a potassium over calcium and something. So potassium is coming, uh, calcium over terrigenous. So the terrigenous will be potassium and aluminum that are uh, reflecting precipitation. So when you have higher calcium, essentially, that means that you have lower terrigenous interpreted as low precipitation. So more rain over here, less rain over here. Let's look at the whole XRF record for the 4.8 to 5.6 million years. I'm just showing you one example. I mean, there are other example. It's changing in the deeper record, but you can look how beautiful is essentially the precipitation record of this record uh, coming from the XRF really fits the local uh, insulation, which is driven by the 23,000 year precession. So, Australia, we see a very strong local procession uh, 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 um, uh, 
uh, overprint, that doesn't mean that it's uh, uh, telling us that it's not part of the global monsoon. We will need to look at more records from that, but I just wanted to share with you. Closer to Papua New Guinea, so this was about 10 degrees south. Now we're talking about three, two degrees south. Uh, this is the work of, of uh, Sam Bova uh, uh, that she started when she uh, came to Rutgers. Uh, looking at the XRF uh, precipitation in the high resolution core of 1486. This is, uh, again, a site that uh, we picked because we knew it will have relative nice resolution. From uh, my under friend Coring, what I want to show you here, I mean, that core is a fantastic core. Um, it has a beautiful layering that you can see here. Very good, uh, both uh, now we have isotopic uh, uh, stratigraphy, but also fantastic uh, uh, paleomax stratigraphy. Rob Hatfield uh, identifies so many of the boundaries over here that you can see the Bruce Matiliana, the Colmantan, Laura Jaramillo, so on and so forth. Very uh, fantastic uh, record that we have. One thing that I want you to notice is that as we go down and down, it gets darker and darker, and you see that the, the, the sediments are progressively becoming more volcanic plastic. We see a lot of ash layer, tephra. And unfortunately, this core at the bottom, at about 200 meter, we hit basalt. So this whole area north of, 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 of Papua New Guinea over here, this is a trench. Subduction trench that you have here. All this basin that you see here, the Manos Basin, this is the Manos Island. That's where the Australians are shipping their uh, immigrants, essentially. Uh, They're not better than the American. Uh, all this has a basement, not the real basement, but at the bottom we have essentially basaltic uh, uh, layers. So I'll just show the, the 800,000 years uh, uh, for now. I don't want to get into the intricacies. Uh, Sam can talk to you about that uh, of, of the volcanic uh, area, but I just want to show again, here is uh, uh, 800,000 years from this record, plotted, and the green ones are the precessional cycle, the 23,000 years. At the top, you have essentially the nice precessional cycle from the speleothome, uh, from the cave deposit over here. And again, notice that every time that goes upward is more uh, precipitation due to stronger summer monsoon, that's the interpretation. And here is our titanium record. And in our case, more titanium is more precipitation, less is less precipitation. And then the LR, you know, that's the essentially the uh, um, global metronome. And here is your oscillation. Again, not getting into too much detail, you can see that even north of us, there is a strong precessional uh, uh, imprint of the precipitation. It's not just procession. Again, uh, this is something that Sam will talk to you, but one of the things that you see nicely is that when it's going wetter in China, in the North China, essentially, it's getting drier in, in, in Papua New Guinea and vice versa. So there is a strong antiphase relationship between those two supporting to some extent the uh, uh, global monsoon hypothesis. Not all the time. We do have some times where we don't actually know where the ITCZ went, may have gone too far to the south, may have shrunk, may, maybe we have the double ITCZ, something that uh, further research should do. Going back to one of the questions on the Holocene, one of the major objectives on Expedition 363 was the question, is the Holocene a typical interglacial or not? Remember the Holocene conundrum. So here, you know, when I, I, I designed it, I knew I wanted a place that we can get really high precipitation, sorry, the position rates uh, uh, during earlier interglacial, mainly I am into the last interglacial, uh, uh, 125,000 years ago, MI5 or the Indian that know, where we have very strong eccentricity. So today, you know, changes in, in modern, Hydrography of the Western Pacific warm pool, mainly temperature, are really small, something on the order of less than 0.5 degrees centigrade. I'm not talking about El Nino and Eastern. And that's because we are in low eccentricity world, meaning very low uh, uh, insulation. Over here, you see the, the, the seasonal insulation during uh, uh, the last interglacial. And it's much higher. Seasonality was much higher. And we expect much 
if you know much larger uh, uh, change in sea surface temperature. So same uh, uh, ran we ran uh, both essentially the Holocene and and uh, the, we reconstructed I should say both the Holocene and LIG uh, uh, sea surface temperature using magnesium calcium in in, in uh, planktonic foraminifera. And what you see over here in the LIG, it really follows nicely, essentially, the insulation. It doesn't stay, for example, uh, 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 constant as the greenhouse gases, the CO2 is showing you. CO2 does very little. And in fact, it's consistent with what the models that uh, Zheng Yu, uh, Liu, and other are using, transient model, that uh, I'll show you a simulation of expected sea surface temperature at that time. So Sam identified, and again, she gave a whole talk, and she just submitted the paper to Nature a few days ago. But the bottom line, and to go here, she developed a method where you can essentially take the seasonal, uh, 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 the idea here, essentially, that the record that we have uh, in planktonic form, Nifra, do not represent mean annual temperature. They are biased toward a certain season. And Sam uh, developed a method, she identified it, she corrected it, came with algorithm to correct it. And now you can see once you correct it, the mean annual showing maybe, maybe some warming, but certainly not the cooling that you expect from this area. And lo and behold, if we now look at the, at the, the, the Holocene, essentially, what we see here is essentially that there is a warming throughout the Holocene as expected from the transient model. So the mean annual temperature looked very different than, than the uh, Holocene. And in fact, when you correct them, there is no more conundrum. Okay, and that, that's really critical if you look now at essentially uh, some of the record, and this is, this is fresh from the oven because IPCC is coming. Everyone is trying to get into this uh, 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 volume. So here's a record that we see the Marquette et al. Uh, 2013 stack for, for the Holocene, essentially. And then the most recent, based on pages, a zillion uh, 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 records that we have here, essentially by Daryl Kaufman. And all, both of them would suggest that there is a, you know, mid Holocene thermal maximum or Holocene thermal maximum, I should say, early in, in mid and, and cooling toward the present. So uh, the new compilation, while better statistic essentially reinforce what it's been done. If we look at Sam new uh, paper, we show that yes, there is a Holocene thermal maximum, but it's only seasonal. In fact, what we see essentially is warming throughout the Holocene, starting with very uh, 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 cooler temperature and, and essentially warming to the present. There is no mean annual temperature in, in, in the, sorry, Holocene thermal maximum in the mean annual. And in fact, what, what that suggests, and I'll show in a second, that we have cooler temperature in the early Holocene, and that's because we still have ice sheet and, and stronger albedo, and then don't have in the Holocene essentially uh, 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 cooling. I'm almost done um, because of the increase in atmospheric CO2 at that time. And uh, here's the comparison of the seasonal over here from Sam's paper, strong uh, mid Holocene term, uh, sorry, early interglacial uh, thermal maximum. We can see here in the last uh, interglacial and then in the Holocene, and you can see the millennial temperature really uh, different. So I think we solved that problem. And in fact, it's nicely uh, 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 now agree with the uh, record of the sea level that we know both on the LIG and the Holocene. I'm not gonna dwell too much on that. I'm happy to answer. I wanna show a couple more things. Uh, uh, poor participant had to squeeze uh, sediments for cold water. There is, uh, this is how they define me there, squeeze, squeeze, squeeze. Uh, this is a picture from the JR100 to show you how we squeeze them with those hydraulic pressures. And some of the simulation that we did here to see whether we can identify this, this peak, maximum peak in, in the pore water, DELO18, which then we can use with chlorinity to tell what was the uh, um, density of, of the seawater during the last glacial maximum. 
And I want to finish here uh, looking forward. So again, I talked about the course that, that Sam uh, uh, talked about, the one that we have a lot of volcanic plastic uh, 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 deposit. You can see beautiful ash layer uh, uh, happening at the early part of the Pleistocene. And uh, here's the record that you see here. So the bottom unit is essentially a lot of volcanic stuff, very few forums, but they are there. And then we hit essentially, we couldn't drill more. And this is an interest for me because, you know, I, I was trying one of the, I hope to start the research, which I, we did to look at tectonic volcanism and climate. There are both the atmospheric radiation effect, but also the weathering effect and changes in alkalinity of seawater. And that goes back to the molnar cronin hypothesis, for example, that most of this, uh, what we call the maritime continent, a lot of the islands were submerged Few million years ago, and due to the push of the Australian plateau, essentially we have uh, uh, a lot of those parts coming, a lot of volcanism, a lot of erosion, and a lot of these are going. So, looking forward, two minutes, and then whoever wants, you know, uh, clearly this generated a lot more questions, both on climate, you know, how the ITCC is moving, what happened in the southern hemisphere, southern part of Indonesia. How is the weathering of, of, of Indonesia contributed to the uh, um, essentially uh, evolution of the neogene climate? And uh, to those of you, I submitted a, a workshop essentially uh, to, to uh, discuss the uh, scientific drilling in the Gulf of Papua. So here's Gulf of Papua. Uh, major rivers like the Fly River, very different uh, 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 geology than uh, and tectonics than than in the north it's it's a big basin we don't know we can drill very deep to the eocene uh here's a seismic line that that andrew Droxler took at that time and there are many many objectives that we we're going to look at them look how beautiful is all those uh, uh sequences that we have both in the coral uh reefs that we have there buried we have myosin uh, coral reef buried we have pleistocene Biosync corals, we have all these fans going on, uh, and they all seem to be uh, corresponding, at least if we interpret it with, with Ken Miller aesthetic sea level. So this is a great target. A lot of organic matter is buried there, and and uh, I hope, you know, given my age and everything, I'll, I'll, I'll get to write the proposal and to drill there. So this is the next uh, uh, target. And if we get funded, which I think we did, I hear, uh, um, next year, hopefully, we can all meet in person and discuss. I mean, I'm working with Francis McDonald actually on, on Papua New Guinea itself, looking at the erosion and trying to connect uh, uh, sources and sinks. So there is a lot to do there. Uh, I'm done here. Uh, I, there is a, uh, another movie here. At the end, I'm happy to show, but I'll leave it for question if anyone wants.